Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt from Zero Carbon Daviot. Um, we've got a few of our other trustees from Zero Carbon Daviot here today who are going to uh, talk as well. Uh, but um, yeah, we've got our um, program up on the screen here. Um, hopefully, everyone online can see and hear me okay. If not, just uh, wave frantically or something. Uh, so we're going to start off talking about energy efficiency myth, myth busting, uh, talking a bit about boiler efficiency. Um, Ken is going to talk about uh, a deep retrofit case study on his own house. And then we're going to finish off with um, a, a, something a little bit different, but talking about a, a community energy project for Daviot. So um, we've shifted the times about a little bit. So first session, I'm probably going to spend close to an hour on that. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll just figure it out as we go. Trying to leave lots of time for questions. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll try and finish by 12, but happy to talk to people afterwards if we don't manage to, to get to all your questions. So um, uh, yeah, if you've got questions, you can type them in the chat. We have to stop screen sharing to see them. So I won't be able to get to them until later, but just to let you know. Right, okay, so um, yeah, I'm gonna start off talking about energy efficiency myth busting. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I stay here in the village, I'm up on the on the estate and um, uh, I used to work in oil and gas. I spent 10, 15 years working in oil and gas before retraining as an architect. And I now um, basically run a, a small architectural practice uh, where we do low energy buildings. So passive house buildings, the German low energy efficiency standard and uh, a lot of retrofit work as well. So I was one of the first retrofit coordinators in the region. And um, I'll maybe talk a little bit about that later on. Um, but yeah, I've renovated my own house as well. So uh, I've, 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 I've done the hands-on stuff as well. Um, and um, yeah, so today uh, I'm gonna to talk a bit about day-to-day -day efficiencies and you know, I know there's there's a lot of information online about things you can do. Excuse me. Um, but um, you know, and th and there's lots of little easy things, and I'll show you a quick list of those. But uh, you know, for the main part, I'm going to talk about how we can improve your houses to make them more energy efficient, improving the fabric of those houses to make them more energy efficient, and talking about materials um, and things like that, and common problems that I see when because I'm going into people's houses every week. And, and trying to explain to you what that looks like in an energy calculation and how to do things properly and some principles to follow. Um, but before I launch into all that, um, is, there, is there any specific topics that people in the room want to hear about today? Everything, all of it. All right, okay, good, fine. <laughs> So um, day-to-day -day efficiencies, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of good lists out on the internet right now with things like this. Uh, if you've got your phone with you and you want to pick up some of the links, I've done QR codes on the screens for various things. But um, there's one from Friends of the Earth Scotland here that's got 50 tips to save money on your, on your bills. Um, and, you know, a lot of these things are pretty obvious, but, um, you know, just worth a reminder, showers are far more efficient than baths. Dishwashers are more efficient than hand washing. Uh, LED light bulbs are definitely the best. They last longer. They use a lot less energy, even less than um, energy saving light bulbs. Um, you know, things like only using as much energy as you need, making sure your boiler is, you know, uh, up, to, up to spec and uh, bleeding your radiators. You know, all these sort of common sense things that maybe we need a little reminder on now and again. Um, so yeah. Uh, pretty pretty straightforward, really. Um, so, when we with, when we're talking about energy efficiency in, in homes, it's, I know it's really difficult for sometimes for people to understand, you know, what's the kind of most cost effective thing to do. And you know, historically, everyone looks at it on a payback model. So, if I spend, you know, a thousand pounds on this, how much energy is it going to save me, and how many years is that is that going to pay itself back? And, I, and I'd say that's important, but there's lots of other parts to the argument as well, such as being warm, having clean, fresh air in your house, uh, just, yeah, comfort, basically. Um, so 
but but when we do look at these things we, we, for clients of mine, um, we provide a graph of all the things they could do to their home, and uh, it, it you know it totally varies from house to house. So this is just four case studies from uh, our projects that show the losses from the building and how they're made up. So in green we've got ventilation losses. Um, which I'll explain in more detail soon, uh, losses from the windows, the floor, the roof, and the walls. And that's, you know, four houses in Aberdeenshire. And the point I'm trying to make here is no two houses are the same. And you've got to think about your house. What shape is it? You know, what, uh, and, and all these things. And that's why we do whole house energy assessments is because really you can't pinpoint what's good right for your house until you've, you've looked at the whole house, the whole dwelling. Um, but one example I'm going to give you here, which is fairly typical of a payback graph. So on the left, we've got years, and across the bottom here, we've got the different measures. And every house is going to be different, but generally there is a pattern where draft, proof, draft proofing and air tightness is, is normally has good payback. Loft insulation normally has really good payback, uh, as does underfloor insulation a lot of the time. Um, if you've got a room in roof, so if your house goes uh, up into the roof and you've got things like uh, dormers, um, then insulating that can be can also be quite cost effective. Um, and then things like um, wall insulation and windows are normally far over there on the right hand side. And you might look at that and think, well, geez, 35 years for a set of windows. I mean, I've seen that figure up at 80 years. And you think, well, I'm going to have to replace the windows before they pay for themselves. But it's not just about that. It's about comfort as well. And it's about the fact that better windows also prevent condensation. So you'll get, uh, you'll get less condensation on a, on, on a triple glazed window. You'll get no condensation, uh, which means the, the building fabric actually lasts longer as well. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and just sort of while we're sort of thinking about all this, um, it, it, I, I, there's a lot of talk about heat pumps at the moment, and heat pumps is definitely what we need to get to net zero and, and have zero emissions homes. Uh, but, you know, we've really got to consider the cost of the energy. And in this country at the minute, you, you're probably already aware of this, but energy, depending on its, where it comes from, is priced completely differently. So a lot of our homes in Davia are on oil, some are, some are on gas. Um, but, you know, electricity is proportionally really expensive per kilowatt. And of course, a heat pump uses electricity, but obviously it gains most of its air either from the air or from the ground. So you get 250% uh, efficiency or 350% efficiency, depending on which one you're using. So you can see we're almost cost parity with ground source heat pumps and gas or oil. Uh, and again, that depends how you're delivering the heat from the heat pump in your house as to whether you might be slightly more, you might be quite a bit less actually. So, um, but just bear that in mind while we're, while we're going through this and think about where you are. Um, but yeah, just uh, to talk about things you can do on, uh, on the fabric of your homes, I'm gonna talk about windows, walls, ventilation, and then heating systems and thermostats. Um, now, starting with windows, um, essentially what is you know, what we need to consider, what, what makes a difference with, with window performance is what it's made of, so it's materials, and how airtight it is. Uh, and, and also, and there's, you have to consider the design of the frame as well as the design of the glazing. Um, so on a lot of modern, even some really good double glazed windows, you'll find the frame is significantly less efficient than the actual glass. So investing in good frames can be really, can be really worth it. And they can be made of anything if they're, if they're designed correctly. So in a passive house, you can have plastic windows, you can have aluminium windows, you can have wooden windows, but it's how they're designed. They need to have a thermal break in them. So, you know, there's lots of little details to all this stuff, but, um, there's been lots of research on this and Historic Environment Scotland about a decade ago uh, compared a whole different uh, array of window solutions because, and because 
uh, you know, with historic buildings, obviously you've got constraints. Uh, you know, I'm sure if you live in a conservation area or a listed building, you know what I mean. Uh, but they essentially uh, went and uh, did a bunch of testing on different solutions. So the testing chamber on the left, and you can see on the right, an example of the sensors they placed on different, uh, different parts of the windows. Um, and they tested all sorts of different things, including um, shutters, um, even insulated shutters that would modify secondary glazing um, and uh, polycarbonate. I sometimes get this on conservatory roofs or, or, or garden shed roofs or things like that, but they compared all of them. And, and um, this is essentially the data that they, um, they came up with. So, this chart here is showing you what it would cost if you were heating your house with oil, what it would cost to heat um, the room, how much energy you'd lose through a window that's 1.5 meters squared. Um, so right at the top, we've got single glazing, which is obviously, uh, obviously the worst. Um, <laughs> uh, we have low E film. Some people have probably seen websites selling this stuff, film that you just stick on the window, not really making much difference. Great to see that curtains are in there, shutters are in there. Um, and I think another thing I really want to point out here is the difference between good glazing and bad glazing. So uh, we've got poor double glazing and good double glazing there. You see the huge difference um, that we've got. So, and obviously when you combine multiple measures, you can make things better as well. So here we've got single glazing with Victorian blinds, shutters and curtains is as good as good double glazing. But again, you know, it's, it's important to think about, well, how are you doing that? Are the shutters, do the shutters fit the window really nice and snug? Do the Roman blinds again, do they actually touch the sill? Do the curtains touch the floor? Do they wrap around the window and touch the wall? It's all these little details all make a bit of difference because it's, it's, as I said, it's a combination of air tightness and materials. Um, so yeah, if, if you live in a listed building, then yeah, you, you're definitely be looking at some of these options. In my house, I'm in a listed building. We've gone for um, the slim light double glazing uh, because it's approved by um, uh, uh, Historic Environment Scotland. Um, but again, there we're only replacing the glazing. We're not improving the frame. And so we still get heaps of condensation on our windows around the edges where the frame is. So, um, yeah, uh, another option would be vacuum double glazing. That's amazing. It's six mil thick. It has a vacuum between two panes of glass separated by tiny metal pins, but it's horrendously expensive. Um, my standard go-to offer for people uh, not in listed buildings is triple glazing. Um, you know, and of course they're the most expensive option, but they're super airtight because they normally have three sets of seals on them. The frames are that much thicker that they perform well as well. And you don't, the, 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 because you've got such a temperature difference from inside to out with triple glazing, you don't get surface condensation and you don't get falling drafts. So, you know, in my house, you stand by a window, you know you're there with, with your eyes shut. You don't get that with triple glazing, which means you don't, don't then need to have the, the radiators under the window. You can have the radiators anywhere you like in the room. So lots of options and quite complicated, but... Um, but yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Um, so how do we insulate other places? How do we insulate our walls uh, and, and our floors and things like that? So I just thought it might be helpful to talk a bit about different materials. Now, um, it's not showing up very clearly there, is it? But we all know what this stuff is, polyisourinate, but most people know it as Kingspan, right? And uh, I'm sure a lot of us have probably got some in our, in our houses and, um, you know, on the surface of it, it's great stuff. So it's got a performance of 0.022. The lower that number is, the better. Uh, so it's really high performing and it's actually quite cost effective because uh, it's so mainstream um, because it's used by all the big house builders as well. Um, but, you know, you've got to ask yourself, what am I trying to achieve here? Because um, it's also got really high embodied carbon emissions. It's got double the, emiss the embodied emissions that go into making it are twice as high compared to something like Rockwell. Um, and also it's just really tricky to actually install it properly. So I'll, I'll show you what I mean uh, here. So um, 
the photo on the left is taken through a, an electrical socket in someone's house. And this person lives in a granite building where they've had um, a team come in and install 100 mil of this. Uh, you know, you can imagine the disruption, all the lath and plaster down, new stud walls up and filled with PIR insulation. But it's quite tricky to cut. If you've got studs that are off at an angle slightly, then you've got to cut it that shape as well. And, you know, you should be aiming to have it wedge in the frame. And, you know, doing that with a handsaw is almost impossible. You should be cutting it on a table saw. It's, it's just really tricky to do properly. And if you do that, you end up with this situation. So this is a photo of a different house, but it's again, 100 mil of Kingspan in a timber frame. And you can see that obviously they've, when they're putting in that piece of insulation in between the frame, they pushed it too far and, it, and, it, and it's gone in and it's created a cold spot. Um, and when you get lots of cold spots like this, you know, everything builds up, it's all, it's all in the details. So um, just to throw you a bit of science at you. So in old houses, I find this particularly a problem. So this diagram here is a little simulation I did the other night. Uh, if you imagine this is a section through um, a roof and we have in the middle of the yellow piece is the timber rafter. Either side, I'm simulating PIR installation and then plasterboard underneath. And you can see timber actually conducts heat quite well. So on the right hand side, the top of the diagram is at minus 10 and the inside is at um, 20 degrees. And you're getting a little dip down to about 18.7 degrees there. And that's what you'll see on the thermal imaging camera. And that's if it's installed perfectly. Now I've crawled around in lots of lofts and the rafters are very rarely like that. The normal, uh, lots of them are skewed. Usually they're different spacings, you know, it's just a nightmare. So if the rafter is skewed like that, with the best will in the world, the best joiner will never be able to cut PIR to fill all those little gaps and, and look at the consequence of that. You get a much bigger thermal bridge on the surface. Um, now, the best technique really is to oversheet. So here, what you really want to do is put another layer underneath um, and you can see that takes away some of the thermal bridging from the timber and keep, gives you a much warmer surface temp, consistently warm surface temperature on the inside. Just shout if I'm losing you here, hopefully it's clear enough. Um, and so you can see if you, even when you oversheet the uh, skewed rafter, the imperfect installation, installation, you know, you're still getting a bit of cold bridging, but it's better. Um, but, you know, I, I, I know other architects, um, but like Chris Morgan from John Gilbert Architects, who are um, the leading energy efficiency experts in Scotland, he will never install PIR in a timber frame. He'll always use mineral wool or some sort of wool because of this problem. So, yeah. The other thing to consider is that um, with this stuff all the time, the other thing you see is huge gaping holes where there's a socket been put in. And normally that's not airtight, it leaks. Air does pass through electrical sockets. So, uh, you know, you run the risk of interstitial condensation if, if warm, moist air can get out through the socket and land in the wall somewhere. So the modern sort of detail here is to have a service void. So hopefully it's clear there, but you've got um, your, your oversheating insulation on the wall here, and then another set of battens to create a service void that all your wiring and your pipes and everything can go in. So this is how new builds are built every day now. You can do it in an existing home as well. I, uh, you know, I obviously accept you're going to lose a bit more floor space for this, but the benefit you're going to get in terms of a consistent internal envelope is, is, is massive. So, um, so mineral wool, yeah, everyone's probably familiar with this stuff. Um, this is a very dusty specimen from my loft. Um, you know, it's, it, it's fine. It's made from rocks. They melt rocks into very th fine pieces uh, like threads and then make a blanket out of it. And you can get quite a few different versions of it. Um, uh, you can get it in sort of bats uh, that uh, you can, and, and the performance can vary quite a bit as well. Anything from 0 0.032 up to 0 0.044 actually. Uh, but it, you know, it's super easy to install. It has less embodied carbon emissions. So it's moderate performance, but obviously if you're trying to achieve the same performance as this stuff, you need, uh, 50, 60, maybe 100% more of it in terms of thickness, if that makes sense. Um, but there's always a few issues with it as well. So um, 
this is a client's house where their room and roof has um, been filled with wool. And if you can just see there, uh, what you get is slump. So it just, it sags. So if you're gonna use mineral wool in this situation, don't buy the cheap loose stuff, buy the bats because they're much more sturdy and you can, you can squeeze them in and they'll hold their shape for much longer. Uh, and you can see here, just here, you've got another gap just in there. And that's where, you know, the joiner's not quite done his, his joists all the same space apart. So you've got this gap. I mean, that's, that's just potentially causing thermal bypass where cold air in this space is getting behind there and potentially all the way behind here and rendering that piece of insulation completely useless. So I'm going to show you some good examples uh, in a minute, but, no, um, but yeah. Yourself. Yeah. And that's not perfect, but that, doing that will have a tremendous impact on the vote. It will save you a lot of money just doing that, even though it wasn't perfect. It doesn't like make it not worth the inconvenience if it's not correct. So I would say that piece is doing nothing. Sure. Some of these bits are doing something, yeah. but also there's nowhere near enough thickness there. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, you're right. It's better than nothing. But actually, if you know what you're doing, you can make it twice as good for a little bit more effort. So that's what I'm trying to show you. Um, right, so next product's Superfoil. The adverts are all over the internet and um, uh, you may see people using it. It's it's like aluminium tin foil with a uh, foam between, and it's multiple layers of it. Now, um, you know, I know a lot of people maybe say this is good stuff, but um, I never recommend it. And the reason I don't recommend it is because all that foil has a potential to trap moisture in places where it shouldn't, and it's also quite hard to install properly. Um, so, yeah. Um, it, and, and also its performance is is not what they claim either, actually. So um, so yeah, if you're thinking about installing that, give me a call and let's talk about what the other options are first. Um, so we're getting better all the time here. So next we're looking at natural materials. So there's, there's more and more of these coming through all the time, but um, uh, wood fiber, hemp, which is now being grown in Scotland and turned into insulation uh, and sheep's wool. I've got a piece here. It's lovely stuff. It smells a bit weird, but it's um, it's lovely stuff. Uh, now, again, it's wool, so you can squeeze it into places. It's quite nice and dense. And obviously it's incredibly good for the planet because it's just free from sheep. You know, you're not having to drill an oil well to make this stuff. Um, so, it, you know, it's not as readily available as other materials. That's part of the problem. Um, but this came from um, from Wales. Uh, and if there's any farmers in the room who, and any investors who want to start a local cooperative doing sheep insulation in Northeast Scotland, then let's, let, please let's do that. It's amazing stuff. And, and wood fiber as well. So, uh, you know, I know obviously Storm Arwen took down a, a heap of trees and uh, unfortunately most of what happens to all that is it gets turned into biomass for burning. But actually we should be sequestering that, turning it into insulation. Um, because it, it's great stuff as well. And the other like major benefit about these products is they do deal, deal with moisture really well as, as well. So if you've got a roof that's got um, Kingspan uh, buried within it um, and you get a leak, uh, cool. if, the, if the water gets behind the Kingspan, it's never gonna get out or it's gonna really struggle to get out. Uh, whereas this stuff, it just, you know, sheep, sheep are out in the rain all the time, eh? So. So yeah, uh, and the other, yeah, no, no off-gassing. So products like Kingspan, um, you know, just by the nature of the way they're made with chemicals, um, they just, and you know, you get this with new sofas as well. Foam tends to off-gas, which creates what's called volatile organic compounds. And if you don't have good ventilation in your house, they're, they're pretty, that's pretty bad for your health as well. Whereas natural products, no harmful chemicals, nothing like that. So, um, so very good for you. So. As I say, the, the availability and the price is 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 obviously uh, not what it, it could be and not what it should be, but um, which means it's not so readily available up here. Um, but yeah, you get fairly decent performance out of it. Um, the other one's cellulose. Um, so this is recycled newspaper and fairly good performance, but it's mega cheap. 
This is really mega cheap and you can use it in retrofit. It can be injected into walls. So depending on how, how your house is built up, um, it, it's, it's great stuff. So I'm building a passive house for a client at the moment with a timber stud um, wall that will be pumped full of this stuff. Um, so yeah, and it's treated with chemicals to um, give it fire resistance and, and all that sort of stuff. But you can buy it in bags for doing your own. If you were taking up your floor to insulate it, you'd need a membrane to support it. But um, the photo at the top there is showing it in a in a uh, an in-floor installation. Uh, yeah, not locally, but um, online you can order the big bags of it. And uh, yeah, there's there's installers who there there is a local installer who will pump it into cavities as well. And again, it deals with moisture really well as well. So Historic Environment Scotland, they pump it into the walls of lath and plaster buildings, which are, are you need to do a bit of analysis first, but um, but that's an option as well. So uh, good design around the edges is really important. Yeah, and um, in an ideal situation, you, you yeah you want to make sure that. If you were pumping this into the cavity of a lath and plaster building, you'd want to make sure that you were doing, you were at least inspecting the roof and potentially fitting a new membrane on the roof to make sure any future leaks are a problem. But the thing is, this can get wet and then dry out again. Um, it's, you don't want it to do that, really. But yeah. Um, no, because if it's being installed correctly, um they um they actually pressurize it to um a prescribed prescribed pressure to make sure it doesn't slump so yeah um right then the next one the next sort of miracle product is aerogel which i've got a small sample of here um now this is amazing stuff that was developed by nasa and if you imagine if you imagine jelly with bubbles in it and you replace the bubbles with a vacuum, that's kind of what you get here. So it's a blanket that has a vacuum in it. It's incredibly light. Um, and this particular version um, is actually made from cellulose. So it's made from recycled coconut husks. Um, now it, it's incredible. It's got 0.015 um, uh, performance value, which is excellent. You can buy it ready, ready attached to um, plasterboard. Uh, you can buy it for use under a floor. Um, but it's it, at the moment, it's hideously expensive. Uh, so you're about 90 pounds a square meter for a piece of this. Um, so, and you need, you know, for, for an old lath and plaster building, you need several layers of it to really make up a decent UV, depending on what you're trying to achieve. But um, but yeah, come come and have a look at that at the end if you like. Um, again, it deals with moisture really well. So actually it's really well suited to traditional buildings. And um, I specify it normally around the reveals of a, of a window where you, know, you haven't got room for much insulation around the reveal of the window because the frame of the window itself, but um, it can just reduce thermal bridging in areas like that. So, um, so yeah. Hopefully there is a local supplier of this stuff who's trying to um, bring the costs down uh, to less than 50 pounds a square meter, but, um, but yeah. Um, the other one is to use recycled materials. So this is a KR group over in Balmedy. So, um, you know, they, they fabricate, well, they do, they do cladding for uh, metal sheds. And at the moment they take the um, roof panels off existing buildings and strip the um, metal sheeting off them to reclaim the PIR inside. So they're fully certified, they're selling it. Um, you know, it's, it's not ideal because you, you can see it's got all these wavy bumps on it and stuff. So you need to be careful about installing it properly because it's a bit more attention to detail to really make sure that it's doing what you want it to. Um, but you know, the great thing there is it's already off gassed. Uh, it's, so you're not gonna get any VOCs from it. We're saving it from going to landfill. Uh, it's super cheap. It's like eight pounds a square meter compared to Kingspan at 22 pounds a square meter. Um, it's, it's lost a little bit of its performance, but you know uh, we've, we've got to embrace the circular economy if we want to uh, if we want to have a sustainable world, as it were.
uh, under the earth's floor, something that uh, looks like a mosquito fluster. So what you've, again, what you've got to be really careful of is moisture. So it depends what building you're in. And certainly in a subfloor situation, um, a lot of the time you can get moisture from the ground coming up. Now, if, if I was to put um, mineral wool uh, between, sorry, that's a sheep's wool, but say that's mineral wool between the joists, and then I put Celotex underneath, that's not a good idea because any moisture that accumulates in here can't get out, it's trapped by the PIR. So um, the other way round would probably be okay um, because, you know, but you've, you've really got to think about like subfloor voids are really complicated because where's your moisture coming from? You've got some coming from the ground, but you've potentially got some coming from inside the house as well. So it kind of depends um, what your application is, unfortunately. Um, it's better if you can just use one product um and a membrane to control the moisture if you can yeah um next product uh is spray foam so yeah um i'm sure some of us know people who've had this done and i just say I just say be very cautious so there's two types of foam there's open cell and closed cell the stuff you get in a squirty can is normally closed cell and what that means is it doesn't let moisture through so it will trap moisture behind it um, the open cell stuff does let moisture through. Um, and I know some listed buildings that have had the open cell uh, foam injected into the cavity behind the lath and plaster. And um, they've done monitoring and it's okay, but it's kind of location specific. And on my projects, I never advocate it. I, I, if a client really wants to do it, then I'll do a hydrothermal analysis. But in general, I'll try and maintain the cavity because you, you need that building to, you know, it, it was built to breathe uh, originally. You need to kind of maintain that to stop the timbers uh, attracting extra moisture and things like that. Nick? I tried it. It's And it's worth saying that some people who've had it fitted have then subsequently found out that their mortgage provider doesn't approve of it. Uh, now, I, I really question as to whether mortgage lenders understand the difference between closed cell and open cell. They probably don't. But, you know, if you're thinking about it, check with your mortgage, mortgage provider first and things like that. Um, yep. It's good for air tightness, I will say that. Um, but... Yeah, so in an underfloor installation, in, installation, it's probably okay, but you imagine trying to remove it. I mean, <laughs> if you've ever tried getting squirty foam off something, <laughs> you'll know what I mean. So um, this is just a little graph showing you the comparison between all these different products. Now, what I've tried to do here is try to say, what would it cost you to achieve the same performance, okay? So bearing in mind that if you're using wool, you'll need twice the thickness compared to the foam board, okay? Uh, and with the aerogel as well. So you can see to achieve the same values, the cost per square meter, I mean, aerogel is, you know, um, thermoflox great, the cellulose is, is absolutely great. Um, you know, PIR is sitting in the middle there. And again, that's because it's so widely available. It's great to see that sheep's wool isn't actually that far off it. Um, Wood fiber isn't so available, but again, I think we should really be making that in Scotland. That would bring that down. That would really help. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, so what does a good install look like? So this, in my book, is, is, is pretty okay. I mean, this is mid-stage. They haven't oversheated it yet. B 
but you can you can't see any gaps between the timbers. It's obviously been cut with a table saw, not a handsaw. Uh, there's no squirty foam filling the gaps. Uh, so you know it's just about time and attention to detail. And once that's over sheeted, it'll look pretty good on a thermal camera. Well, would you uh, tape that to seal the joint? Uh, Probably yes. If it was my own, I would then I I would be applying silver tape between the tape. Between yeah, the tape. The yeah, and I would actually be doing it on both sides, inside and out. And on the outside, I'd be using a different type of tape. So you know, thermal bypass. That's a great explanation by Chris Morgan. He said, uh, if you think about bi thermal bypass, it's essentially air from the outside, kind of trying to get in, and it doesn't make it into the house, but it does make it behind bits of insulation. And then it renders those bits of insulation uh, null and void. So sealing the outside can be just as important as sealing the inside. But in a retrofit situation, that's difficult. So yeah. So there is gaffer tape, yeah, um, absolutely. But again, going back to that graphic earlier, if it's a twisted rafter, you're not going to know if there's a gap there, are you? Uh, so yeah. Hard, even with working with some really good joiners, it was um, it was really hard to get it in the spot we thought was best at the time. But there's a lot of filling of voids and tucking things in. And yeah, we taped over everything like the aluminium tape, including the timber. So not just the joining, we taped everything you could see that was attached, not attached to the actual GIR you know, boards. Um, so there's two schools of thought here as well when it comes to moisture. You can, if, if you're going to use the tape across everything and you're going to use foil you're creating an impermeable barrier to moisture. So any moisture that's inside can't get out and any moisture that's that side can't get in. Um, so that means you, you need to have good ventilation inside the house so that you're cooking, you're showering, you're breathing, all those things, you've got a way of getting rid of that moisture. So that's what we call a vapor closed um, construction. Traditional buildings, it's better to use uh, a, a vapor open strategy. So sustainable material natural materials and membranes that allow the moisture to go both ways you still need uh, ventilation inside the house to for when you know those high um emitting activities like showers but um so this is another good example of good roof insulation here so you know it's all really nice and flush here there's no gaps you know i i mean i don't know exactly which building this is in but you, you can tell it's just really consistent and good. Um, and hopefully the guy's going to cut a little slot around this post here when he when he's rolled that out. Um, but yeah, the attention to detail is, is, is what really makes insulation work properly. And this is a, a great example of um, the service cavity. So what you're looking at here is, um, I think it's a stone wall with, um, it's had an internal uh, insulated frame uh, constructed. They've put this Intello membrane across. So this is uh, a really intelligent membrane that allows moisture to travel both ways, depending on what the, the particular situation is. The blue stuff here is Tesco and Varna airtight tape. You can see that they've taped every single joint and they've taped the window frames to the membrane. They've also, that they'll have insulated these reveals here to eliminate the thermal bridging around the windows. Um, and then you can see these battens on the surface are forming the service void and all the sockets, you can see the sockets sitting on the, on the face here, which means where the wire, um, the, the wire doesn't penetrate the insulation. You know, so when the plasterboard goes on, there's no more holes getting made in the insulation. It's nice and consistent and, um, and yeah. Um, so, and design is really important as well. So this is a, a, a client's house out in Monimusk, and this is like a, a cold, uh, like a garden room where they grow uh, fruit and veg and their house is here. And they've got a log burner in the living room here with a 
exposed brick wall, um, the concrete's on, you know, visible in the living room. And they thought, oh, well, you know, this is, the, we must be losing a lot of heat into this space in winter because this is, you know, completely open. Uh, so they had a timber frame partition uh, with insulation built uh, on, on here, um, but they didn't actually understand kind of how to do it. How, it wasn't designed as such. So everyone sort of would say, oh, you need a 50 mil ventilation gap between your insulation and your stone wall. That's very true with an external wall, but actually this is an internal wall. So um, they left that 50 mil ventilation gap and they put little vents in the, um, in the wall that they built, top and bottom. And so that's what it looked like on a thermal camera looking up into that space. Essentially, the log burner was heating air in that cavity and then it was convection straight out. So not saying it's not done nothing, but um, because there's no real huge moisture risk here, the insulation could be put hard against the stone in this case, it's an internal wall. So um, yeah, we're gonna rectify that soon. So it's just the understanding buildings and, 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 and you know, how they work. Um, sorry, I'm, time's creeping on. Um, so another one here, right, this is a photo of someone's ceiling in their living room uh, in a flat in Aberdeen. And uh, anyone have a guess what's, uh, well, I've said at the top there, haven't I? Uh, there's a water tank in the loft. And I get this all the time where people say, oh, I was told not to put insulation there because I need to make sure the tank doesn't freeze. Well, it's not the tank that freezes, it's the pipes that come off the tank. You know, it's a huge body of water. It's the pipes that are gonna burst. So the solution is, you know, insulate the tank, insulate the pipes, over insulate the pipes. Uh, and then you can insulate the whole ceiling uh, and not have any cold spots. Um, and when it comes to, um, well, yeah, and the other option is get rid of the tank. Most houses that are built now don't have water tanks. They're fed directly off mains pressure. So obviously depends where you're located, but that's another option. So pipe lagging, just another little bugbear of mine. So this stuff, the cheap stuff um, is terrible because as it ages and dries out, this tends to open up like that. It shrinks and opens out or it shrinks lengthways, which is what you can see here on this diagram, exposing all these little details. So uh, this stuff's called, called Armour Flex. It's made from a different type of foam that doesn't shrink and it's got sticky tape on the uh, faces. So you put it on and you stick it together um, and always make sure obviously you're getting the right pipe diameter size by as thick as you can afford. And just the diagram on the right here is showing, you know, attention to detail again, every little junction. And I see this in houses all the time where the hot water tank, it's not been lagged, you know, I mean, what, what's that doing? It's doing nothing. <laughs> so, um, you know, you think, oh, it's my airing cupboard, you know, it's drying my clothes. It will dry your clothes anyway. Right? The tank will still let off a bit of heat. Um, all, all that's happening is you're losing more energy in the winter. And in the summer, if you're room in roof, then you know largely this could be attributing to overheating uh, in that space in summer as well. So always lag your pipes, please. Uh, so ventilation losses. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So. Uh, these are a huge problem. Uh, as you saw in the graphs at the start, they can, they can ac uh, account for 40% of uh, your energy loss. Letterboxes, windows, keyholes, uh, electrical sockets, plugs, poor junctions of pipework through the building envelope. Uh, you know, number of times I see a water tank that's in, the, in, in an upstairs room and the pipes go up into the loft and there's just a huge hole through the plasterboard, you know. Again, all these little things um, add up. Um, so just to talk about some of the ones that I find. Um, so if you've got an open fireplace in your house, um, get rid of it immediately. That, that, that's a huge source of energy loss when you're not using it. Um, and uh, yeah, I was in a house two weeks ago where a sort of long L-shaped house, they had an open fire at one end and then at the other end, they had a log burner in the kitchen. And when they lit the log burner in the kitchen, <clears throat> I could measure the wind speed coming down the chimney at the other end of the house. So, um, you know, you've, it, it, you, you've really got to think about how air is moving in your house. Um, so as a temporary solution, get a chimney sheep uh, on top right there. So a little uh, sheep's wool bung or a chimney balloon, um, wedge that in there. 
I mean, and, and sorry, maybe a bit confusing. This image, thermal image here is showing the heat conducting to the outside. So that's not a ventilation loss, but you know, just showing you that fireplaces aren't always a good thing. What you could do is use infrared heaters instead. So um, these are getting more and more popular. The little panel heaters and they emit infrared. They're not like a radiator. So that's what you get when you sit in front of a fire is radiation in your face. And that's th these are great. You know, if you're working from home, a little one of these under the desk to keep your legs warm can, can work wonders. Uh, it's sort of like a really cost effective way of, of local heating. Um, but if you are going to get a log burning stove, then get one with a direct air intake. So this is where they have, as well as a, a flue coming out the top, you have an intake coming out the back. So on the right here, you can see the intake duct. And what that means is, because essentially what happens when you light a normal log burner is that it's got to get its combustion air from somewhere, right? And if it can't get it through a, a, a vent next to the fireplace, it's going to get it through your letterbox, it's going to get it through your loft hatch, it's going to get it through floor hatch, it's going to get it from anywhere it can. And of course, if it's bringing it in from outside through the house, then you know it's going to come through the room that you're in and you're going to get cold feet. Uh, now, I fit one of these in my own house. So the image you see here, uh, I recently, this was a nightmare job, but I fitted um, direct air intakes. I've got these, these silver shiny aluminium um, ducts are the air intake for my stove. And just for a bit of fun last night, I thought, well, I'll, I'll measure that. Uh, so with the fire lit, um, I got a wind speed of 1.8 meters a second across all three intake ducts. And when you do the calculation, that's sucking 350 meters cubed of air into the room. Uh, now, my plan is I'm going to duct these through the, this wall and into the basement. So it will take the air directly from a cold source. Um, and then I can seal the, the room and make it airtight. But when you do the numbers, that volume of air for me is 300 watts, which is three, th close to 3%. Of, so this is generating 13 kilowatts. 3% of that energy is just going into heating the air that is dragged in from outside through my living room. So um, yeah, little experiment, but there we go. So direct, direct those ducted to the outside won't drag the air in through your room. They'll take it straight from outside and all you're getting is the heat into the room. Um, so other ventilation losses that I see. Um, so here we've got a house um, which has got a front porch and uh, I know this is really common, lots of us have them um, and everyone thinks, oh, you know, that's really helping. And I think it's helping to a certain degree but what I typically find is that you have two doors that don't have, that aren't sealed very well and aren't very insulated. You're much better off just having one good, really well sealed, possibly insulated door. So in this instance, the, the inner door here, really lovely hardwood door. It does have seals around the edge, although you know there is a bit of a gap in the corner there that would annoy me. Uh, and then on the threshold, it has a timber threshold going right the way under and no seal on it. And um, what it looks like on the thermal camera is that. So you can see the difference between having a seal and not. It's just sucking cold air into the house again. Again, this house had an, actually had an arga that was on all the time. So it, 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 that was sucking in cold air from anywhere it could. Um, and, and just window seals. So this is a flat in Aberdeen. You know, the window seal is, is, is just there and it's filthy. And, it, 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 I didn't even have a, any proper equipment on the go that day, but I measured drafts just because the seal was dirty. So little cheap, simple measures of cleaning seals, replacing them, making sure they're all functioning correctly. Um, yeah. Uh, see this a lot. So a lot of the time windows um, have come away from their little skews. So there's drafts getting in there. On this case, it's on the inside. Sometimes it's where the window sill hasn't been fitted correctly and they come in underneath. Uh, you know, so all these little details need fixed. Um, and a lot of the time, these little skews are made of cement, which is obviously hard and, and cracks over time. Now, uh, you know, what we, we do um, in my practice is, is a scientific approach. So um, we uh, execute blower door tests on as many projects as possible because you don't need to rely on it being a windy day, then you can 
uh, go around the building while the fan's running. So this fan here is essentially pressurizing the house and you can go around and identify all the leaks and that's what we do. So on the right here, we've got a drawing with the yellow showing all the little leak points we've found. So we'll need new window seals in some of these. Maybe it just needs the window adjusted to make sure the seals make contact again. Uh, and uh, the red lines indicate a suspended timber floor because quite often the junction between the wall and the floor uh, is, a, is a point that can bring a lot of uh, uncontrolled air in as well. Um, yeah, and you know, you want to make your house more airtight and, and have less uncontrolled ventilation, um, but don't make it too airtight. So um, this house has this Velux in it, and actually, you know, it's quite a decent, thick, double glazed window here. Uh, it's east facing, so it does tend to get a fair bit of sun, but there's obviously a huge amount of condensation happening on this. And this was in a room that a client had had relined. Um, you know, re-insulated and re-lined recently. And the door was quite often shut on it. And I think to me, this actually speaks of a, of a house that's too airtight. So any moisture that happens in this room, it can't get out, it can't move around. So how do you do better, better, better ventilation uh, is, is another question. Um, so yeah, and boilers just, uh, I see oversized boilers all the time. So heating engineers have historically just been really lazy and they fit oversized boilers. And if those oversized boilers are running all the time, then you're just burning gas or oil for no reason. But um, if, and if you don't have a, a, a wall thermostat, get one. Even a cheap plastic one uh, that doesn't do anything can still save you money because uh, you know, a lot of people say to me, oh, well, I've got the, the ones on the radiators, uh, thermostatic radiator valves, they're called, and they uh, will control that radiator, but they don't talk to the boiler and turn the pump off. And that's what this does. So you might have your, your heating could be running and all your radiators are like, oh, it's, it's hot in here. I'll turn this radiator down. But the boiler is still sending hot water around a loop, which in pipe work, which is quite often in a cold space, uh, wasting energy. So get a thermostat, it'll turn that off. Uh, and of course you can get smart ones. So there's a hive, there's a nest, there's a few others. Um, some of them are intelligent. Uh, it's also worth looking at ones that uh, consider the outdoor temperatures. Um, but I bought three of the nests products um, for my house, uh, which is zoned and they pay for themselves within six months. So, um, so yeah. A sparky or easy um, fit one of those but yeah so that's kind of the bulk of that content and it's the principles really uh, to follow up build tight ventilate it right uh, and if you insulate you must ventilate and when i say ventilate you know I, it, minimum you need is extractor fans in your wet rooms there are other options so as, as well which will improve the air quality and efficiency of your home so on the right here we have what's called a a decentralized mechanical extract fan. Now it's like a normal extractor fan, except that it runs all the time, 24 hours a day. And it has two modes. It has a low trickle mode and a high, higher extract mode. And uh, the sensors in it, if it's moist or there's too much CO2, it kicks onto the higher rate until it's gone and then it drops down. And it may sound counterintuitive that that running all the time will save you money, but actually that constant sort of pressure of air outside resists the wind that normally comes in through those vents. So it, they do save you money on paper. They use very little ele electricity and they do save you money. They're not cheap, unfortunately. Um, you're close to 200 pounds for one of those, but it can, it can bring more, uh, more fresh air into your home. Um, through, uh, yeah, as well. Uh, the other option is, um, sorry, it's not very clear here, but this is um, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. So this is a fully ducted system to every room. This is the bee's knees. This is the ultimate solution. So with, with mechanical ventilation, what happens is that fresh air is brought in from outside and it's put through a, a heat exchanger. Hot, stale air leaves the house in ducts, goes through the heat exchanger. It passes 90% of the heat into the incoming air and supplies that to all your other rooms, like your living rooms and your... Um, and your your bedrooms. Um, so uh, Ken's installed one and he's gonna vouch for it in a moment, uh, but they really help efficiency. You get more fresh air in a house with, with MVHR 
than one that's not. Um, so they can eliminate, uh, you know, even if you were fitting this in a, in a poorly insulated home, it would still provide a benefit because it's that circulation of air that's, uh, limit, you know, it's taking the moisture out of the building and it's bringing warmer, fresh air in. Obviously, you've got to run ducts to every room, so it's expensive. Uh, from that regard, you might be sort of eight or nine thousand pounds for a typical house, but it will do wonders for your health. Um, so, especially in urban areas, it does. It, 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 yeah, the best application of this that I've seen is in schools, where it's, it's largely eliminated um, uh, cases of asthma in schools where it's been installed. So, because uh, it has filters in it that clean the air as it comes in. Um, yeah, so just a couple of quick case studies from our, what, what we're doing in our practice is this is a granite uh, end terrace on King Street and through roof insulation, through triple glazing and through insulating a single story extension at the rear, we're bringing the overall energy efficiency down. Uh, we're reducing the energy consumption rather by 48% and that's just getting them to the point where they can have a heat pump. Uh, so this whole house approach is really important as well, considering all the things you can do uh, and how they interact. Um, this is the same house I showed you earlier. In this case, they're fitting MVHR. Um, they are doing little bits of insulation. We're making the house super airtight. So at the moment they have an Arga and she has a cupboard in the corner, which she uses as a larder because it's got a hole this big through the wall. Now you might think, oh, well, that's great. That keeps all my food cold, but it's just, it's, the house is Baltic. And actually in their bathroom, uh, it's, it's quite musty. So the house is under ventilated in one sense, but over ventilated in another because they're cold. So by fitting the MVHR, we can seal up every single nook and cranny around the rest of the house uh, because we know we're getting enough fresh air from the ventilation system. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and this is a timber kit house uh, in Stonehaven where there's a whole raft of measures actually, uh, air tightness, loft insulation, floor insulation, uh, a bit of roof, uh, slopes roof insulation. But again, we're bringing that down by 40% uh, stage one. And then there's some further measures that would bring it down by 70%. Um, so yeah, and just uh, a little, um, plug here for a new cooperative I've started with a few uh, friends and colleagues. Um, it's so evident that people need help and that's obviously why I'm here today, uh, but uh, they need uh, professional support as well. So um, we've called it the Nesfit Hub. Uh, we're looking for funding and um, so if you're feeling generous, then please donate. And we're looking to provide the retrofit coordination service for people to basically help them um, get what they want, looking at the whole house approach and work with contractors such that uh, we can oversee what the contractors are doing and make sure it's done right uh, and make sure that what they want to achieve is delivered. Um, so yeah, we've got a number of projects on the go. One is community awareness workshops, which will hopefully be running next year. Um, if you're not aware, there's uh, the Just Transition Fund have launched this thing called participatory budgeting. So community groups were able to um, apply for money um, and participatory budgeting is where you, the public, get to vote on which projects get funded. So we've put in a project to buy a load of surveying equipment uh, that could be used uh, by community groups for free. So things like thermal imaging cameras and um, other testing equipment. Uh, so, you know, just trying to improve community awareness of, of how our buildings function. Um, so when you see that, please, uh, please vote for us. Um, you'll get 10 votes, so you're not losing someone else's vote. Um, contractor awareness and training. So I'm talking to a load of retrofit training providers. It's, if you want to do an installation with a Home Energy Scotland grant in the Northeast at the moment, there are no qualified contractors. They all come up from Glasgow or Edinburgh. So you've probably seen the houses in the village this week that got insulated, the external wall stuff. Uh, the van, I saw it there the other day, they come up from Glasgow. We need local contractors, like the jobs opportunity here is massive. So I'm, tr I'm working with local contractors on my projects and I'm trying to get uh, retrofit training by experts from down south to come to Aberdeen and do that. So hopefully that will start next year. And then retrofit plans for all is another thing we're trying to push. So this idea of a whole house plan. So um, yeah, anyway.
anyway, sorry, I've done a lot of talking here and we're at 11 o'clock, but um, I'm going to do five minutes of questions and if people like a quick two minute break while we switch over, then um, yeah, hopefully that was helpful. Maybe, maybe just ask a question to schools and public schools. And if you're about to go to one of those basic requirements for teachers to be trained, what would you recommend you do that? Um, from the exhaust gases that are going up the flue. Um, yeah, so I know people have looked at things like heat recovery, um, but you've got to be quite careful, obviously, because um, the chimney is designed for a certain diameter and a certain length because it needs the draw to, br to, to bring it through. So, um, yeah, I'm not really clear on mainstream solutions for that, to be fair. Yeah, it's it's not a mainstream solution, I think, um, is the answer. But yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Um, most of you have a, a bench at the top. Would you recommend that that be closed or stay open? So, um, yeah, you're talking about trickle vents on windows. Should they stay open or closed? So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so the, the way that most houses work per, per the Scottish building standards is that um, you get your fresh air from those vents. So um, we're talking about, yeah, the little, we can see them up here, everyone's got them probably. You're getting your fresh air from those vents and uh, any moisture or uh, pollutants you're creating in the house are being evacuated by your extractor fans, which come on or off depending on how you use them. So um, if you've got, the, but, but the problem is in winter, of course, everyone closes those and they turn their extractor fans off. And that's, it's really dangerous because now you're trapping all the CO2, you're cooking all the po cooking pollutants and all the moisture, you're trapping them in the house. I mean, if you've got a really drafty house, then on a windy day, they'll, they'll blow out now and again. But there's a huge difference between controlled ventilation and uncontrolled ventilation. So the best scenario is to make the envelope of your house as airtight as possible, and then use controlled ventilation to bring in fresh air and get rid of stale air. So if you make your home airtight in its fabric, then I think you'll find that having the trickle vents open in a room is not so painful. But ultimately, uh, my standard recommendation to everyone, if they can, is to go for MDHR, because on a, on, I know what it's like on a windy day, the, the trickle vents will still blow right through, won't they? And that there are some companies developing products, intelligent trickle vents, so something that you can retrofit in that window that um, would recognize the airspeed and, you know, admit slightly less on a windy day. Um, so that, that, that's possibly worth looking at, but Ultimately, if you close all those, you've got no fresh air in your house. So, yeah, you've got to be careful. Cool. All right. Um, I, so the question, just for those online, is yeah, granite houses is is mechanical ventilation still kind of viable and cost effective? And and actually, I'd say um, yeah, it is. I mean, if I um, go back to that slide here, so in this house, it's um, it's classically um, uh, room and roof. So you've got the eaves space uh, either side of the stud walls upstairs this triangular void that's kind of above the, the ground floor. And that's perfect for running ducts. 
So that's what we're doing in this scenario is we're actually going to take down, take down that wall or take the plasterboard off that wall and fit the ducts behind there. Um, so it really depends on the layout of the house. But in this case, because it's quite a small compact house and they, they, would, they were desperate to get on a heat pump. Uh, this was really a really a key way of saving energy for them to get on a heat pump um, as well as the other health benefits because we, we you know there wasn't much more insulation we could add internally it just their rooms were getting so small if we did that so um yeah Yeah, so that's important to say is um, in, in that project, we're fitting the MVHR at the same time as we're moving, moving the Arga at the same time that we're making it more airtight because we don't want that risk of making it airtight and then them suffocating in the house before the MVHR goes in. We're all doing it as part of one stage. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah concrete floors are a difficult one because... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you've, you've essentially got, I guess, three options. One is dig it up and fit an insulated slab uh, to replace it. Uh, obviously, very costly and disruptive. Uh, the second option is probably just to oversheet with a bit of insulation. So uh, on some projects, we're fitting a, a 20 millimeter thick insulation board made of foam. Uh, you can also buy them with the grooves in them for overflow heating, uh, which is a great solution, especially if you're thinking about a heat pump. Um, the third option is, um, is uh, insulating the ground around the house. So if you imagine that concrete is conducting all the heat sort of into the ground and then it's going sideways and then up into the sky. So what you can do is fit perimeter insulation is called. So a trench around the house basically um, with sort of flanking insulation like that. And it just kind of acts like a hat or they call it a heat dome. So it keeps the, it keeps the heat in the ground and that kind of acts as your insulation, if that makes sense. So yeah, a couple of different options. Yeah. Yeah, so to what extent do heat pumps work in the northeast? Um, it totally depends on how leaky your building is. So they can definitely work. There's no, there's absolutely no problem if the house has been well insulated enough. So um, there's obviously a difference between air source and ground source, but for our homes, yeah, we definitely got to, most of us have got to insulate and make airtight before we can get to a heat pump. Yeah, I, yeah. So going back to that graph earlier on about cost, comparing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, you got to take it case by case and see whether it's been installed correctly and whether they've designed the system properly. Um, but uh, there's absolutely no reason why we can't get on heat pumps. Yeah. Right, uh, so we're 10 past 11 there. I think I'll pass over to Ken if that's all right. Uh, oh, well, just, um, yeah. Quick, quick two minute break. Yeah. Should we open a window seeing as we're losing it? <laughs> Cool. Yeah, sure. Sure, Jim. Yeah. Do you want a card? Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. No, thanks for coming. You lock these halfway.
Yeah, sure. We come for. No, just yeah, out there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Many little bits. Yeah. Might be random. Which might be okay, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a retrofit assessment is what I do basically. So, yeah, um, ping me an email and I'll I can send you an estimate. And if you let me know uh, your address as well, and yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to go for an hour. Oh, nobody's complained, have they? Yeah. Just going to talk very briefly about that. But... <laughs> All right, sorry. Do you want to? Right, okay, do you want to speak about that or do you want to? Let's get Nick to come up here and he can talk about it. It's a bit weird when you touch it. Right, would you like to take a seat again and we'll uh, try and crack on? Um, right, okay, so an interesting yeah. So one one other thing that we were just gonna uh, cover was um was boiler efficiency. So um there's this thing called the boiler saving challenge, um, which mostly applies to gas boilers, but Nick's had a go at it and he's gonna explain his experience of it. Yeah. Hello, hello. So we had hoped that this would be more applicable because people were, were talking about it. Um, and uh, even my wife had said, yeah, um, mum's done it. And I was like, all right, let's have a look at this and see what it's all about. And um, unfortunately for our location, it's based on if you've got a combi boiler. So for 
the majority of people here, we don't have combi boilers. Some, some of the new ones have. Um, but you can go online and have a look. And uh, if you have other family members who, who have got gas boilers or live in towns with gas, it's really good. Um, you can click through it and it shows you uh, in very simple terms graphically, what does your boiler look like? Does it look like this? Does it look like this? Have you got a storage tank? Yes, no questions. And it ticks your way through. And in essence, it's helping you um, reduce the flow temperature of your boiler because we're all very used to having 85 degree hot water going around our radiators and um, scalding hot water in our storage tanks. But um, what we can advise through this system is if you have storage tanks to turn that water down for health reasons. So we have to have um, 70 degree plus heating on hot water storage tanks for Legionnaires disease. But if you have a combi boiler without a storage tank, you can actually turn your flow rate down to 55 degrees. And it'll really reduce how much effort the boiler's working at. Um, you don't need that water coming out your taps at any more than 55, because that's still not really put your hand in temperature, it's hot. Um, but your radiators work away really well at, at 55. And so, yeah, it's been really good success. So the, if you go on the site, it tells you how many people have already been doing the challenge. So there's a lot of people at it. And um, there's a really good, good, just practical saving to be had. But we thought there was maybe more attached to different style boilers, but it's actually just for your, your combi one. But um, definitely worth having an investigate. And yeah, if you can pass that info on for people, it'll be, it'll be practical, you know, really easy, really easy. Yeah. So that's it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's totally doable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just laugh. You've got mixer taps and everything else, and you're like, yeah, you're just, you're just putting really hot water and cooling it down loads so you can actually use it, and you're like, what's the purpose of this stuff? I'm lucky I can control my hot water separately at home, and I've got it down to just below 55 right now, as you see. Um. I might take it down a little bit more because it's only hot water, but we'll we'll see how we go. Yeah. Yeah, so quick and easy, but it's worth every having a look at it if it suits. But yeah, that was our our boiler challenge. Let's uh, have a look. Okay, thanks. Cool. Great. Sorry, over to Ken. I just switched off. Sorry, I think it's still going. Is that okay? Bit more. I can't hear you. You can't hear me. No. Is that working now? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Yeah. Is it okay? Um, right. There we go. Okay. Full screen. So, so um, yes, thanks everybody for coming here today. Interesting that Nesta. Um, thing that Nick did there. I was speaking to a guy from Nesta. They're a charity, a UK charity, um, and they, they've had a tremendous, tremendous uh, response. And so they're going to relaunch the whole thing again um, with a bit more funding. Um, so watch the space. I just thought we'd have a, a one minute silence to just remind ourselves why we're here. Um, and, you know, this is quite telling, really. So just very scary what is happening to the planet. This is NASA who've monitored the ice cap at the North Pole since 1975, and that's what's happening. So it's you know, this is the other side of the story. We're, we're here to save energy, but by saving energy, we're reducing our carbon dioxide emissions. So um, here we go. Deep retrofit David. Um, 
I was quite happy to, uh, to give this presentation before Matt gave his because I thought I was speaking to uh, a room full of people who didn't know anything about this, but now you're all going to sit there and go, why did you do that? <laughs> anyway, here we go. So <clears throat> deep retrofit, what's it about? Um, and it's really, it's what, what have we done? We've, we've lowered our energy costs and CO2 emissions massively. Why did we do it? Well, we wanted to stay in Davia because we like it here, but we couldn't afford to live in our house um, as we have to <laughs> rely on pensions. So uh, it, it was important to do it. When did we do it? Well, it wasn't quick. We started in 2011 and we only finished last year. So 10 years, uh, it's a, a long, long thing to do. And how did we do it? Well, we did it with just using professional engineering and good building practices. Um, and hopefully <laughs> when we go through it, you'll see that uh, I almost did what Matt has suggested. Um, and where was it? Right here in Daviot. And who did it? Well, um, I, I was kind of there, but you know, Meg, I was working offshore for uh, a few months and Meg was the, uh, was the project manager on a lot of this stuff. So if anybody really wants to know about the, um, the hassle that um, a deep retrofit brings to your home, Ask Meg afterwards. We were supported, of course, by local tradespeople because it was just too much for us to do on our own. So, um, what do we use? I, I, I'd, I'd come across this thing called Enerfit, which is a passive house, but for people that are retrofitting their homes. And th this is kind of what I followed um, because it was the only guide I had. But of course, we've moved on now, and there is this um, um, past 2035, uh, which is what Matt's um, been working to. And these 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 um, points here are really what a, a, a deep retrofit's about, according to Enerfit, which is um, improving thermal insulation, which we've talked about, reducing thermal bridges that Matt's talked about, where you've got these little bits where there's no insulation. Um, and considerably improving the air tightness. And again, Matt's talked about that. Uh, the use of high quality windows and doors and ventilation with highly, highly efficient heat recovery, efficient heat generation and the use of renewable energy sources. So that really kind of summarizes what Matt's just spoken about. Thank goodness. So I'm just gonna do like the uh, NASA thing here for the planet. Um, I'm just gonna skip through um, lots of photographs just to let you see step by step, step by step what we did. So we started off with our bungalow, which was built in 1977. I think it was the first timber frame house in the village. Uh, pretty sure it was actually um, with, you know, so there's a, a big learning curve there for the builders. Um, we then put an extension on for Meg's dad who came to stay with us in 1995. And then we stuck a porch on the front. So we're now sitting with a, a five bedroom house 210 square meters of area. So here we go. This is this is it. We started. This is just one room, and I'll just go through it quickly. So here we go. That's the carpet out, uh, carpet away. Lift up the underfloor, um, the foam underneath. Up goes the floor, and you can see we've taken the walls out there. Then what we decided was we'd put mesh underneath to keep the mice out, um, but you can see it was hopeless. It was all Bendy. So we decided in the end to put um, sheeting underneath and although Matt was a bit concerned about this to begin with, uh, I think we decided that it was going to be okay. Um, there's the floor back in, so we used the Kingspan insulation and it then the floor goes back on. Sorry, sorry Michaela, I didn't know you were going to be. <laughs> um, then the walls, so we did the walls. It's just complete mess. We had to smash it off. So you can see the 1970s um, insulation there. I thought it would have slumped more than that, but you can see that it's really quite well in place. And the, the vapor barrier is just a sheet of polythene over the top. Um, yeah, well, what, what we did is this one was an experiment, this first room, um, and that's why it's all on that one. And then we, I put temperature sensors on to see what happened before and after and it was good. So then we got in the, the tradespeople to, to just blitz the rest of the house. 
Um, but here's a point that Matt was talking about, which is that, you know, the Sparky's obviously come along with his, um, wanted to put his socket in there, so he's just ripped out the insulation out of the way and thrown it away. And you can see the, the sort of blackness um, there where, um, where the, the mold has started. And in fact, we always wondered why that corner had mold growing on it. Now we know. Was it like the fiberglass? It was just fiberglass, yes. Just 1977 fiberglass. It wasn't even proper rock wool. You know, that horrible stuff that gets in your throat. And it was, we used masks, as you noted. Um, just complete, you know, mess. Everything out. We, we popped these uh, out in the garden so the tradesmen could work underneath. So now we're, we're getting to the, to the walls. And so we've, we've, We've put in the, the king span here, but we had the same issues that Matt was talking about. And uh, I, Matt doesn't approve of this, but nevertheless, what we did was we found we couldn't really fit the the panels in tightly because you, you know when you, they're all different spaces, and when you pushed it in, you just got a bunch of dust in your face, and it was horrible. So um, we so what we did was we we, we machine cut them, but um, we left a gap and foamed it afterwards so that those because we knew that the insulation if the air was getting around it would not not be good so then we sheeted over the top and as you can see we've taped every single joint there now we didn't go for a service void because this is a retrofit we really we're already losing you know a little bit with the oversheeting in terms of room space we really didn't want to go for another service void so i kind of left the electrics on the outside because you don't want them to be over insulated and then we so we penetrated so exactly what matt was saying you know every socket that was on an outside wall and we tried not to have any um we we absolutely taped it up around the outside inside and um we also phoned where the cables came through and you know we were we did understand uh, well later that the foam can affect cables but i've got um an email that i meant to send to matt i forgot sorry um, that from Seeker who uh, make this stuff and they've done in-house experiments and they are completely satisfied that it does not affect electrical cabling unless you do a whole load and it overheats. So we're just doing penetration. So. Um, we also taped over the top of every screw head. So that we sheeted over the top and we didn't leave anything to, to chance. Um, around the windows, Matt's talked about that. And this is, this is it stripped back. And I don't know if I took enough pictures of it, but that gives you an idea of what we did. Now, it's a bit fuzzy because I've had to zoom in, but we, we the, the in goes, or what did you call them? The, the reveals, yeah. So we, we, we actually put insulation into those and taped it up. And it's not shown here, unfortunately, but what we also did was we then taped from the in go into the window. Now, we didn't know about Tescon tape um, and it's 40 quid a reel at that time so i went along to sellers and i bought some silage tape which was perfectly perfectly good flexible and it's you know it, it lasts out in the field for years so um i probably use tescon now but <laughs> at that time we didn't know about it and then uh, finally plastering over the top finishing it off and that's fine quantity surveyor there working away for us and, that, and that's the the room uh, finished um, and you can see the storage heaters that we were living with. I've still got it in the middle of the room there because this was the experimental room. Right, right. So on the floor, uh, we uh, because we put the timber underneath the joists, we put um, the joiner said to me, look, it's a, it's a nightmare, that thick stuff, get two, two layers. So we used um, a layer of 90 and a layer of 50, which gave us 140, and that completely filled the joist up. On the walls, modern timber frame houses, I think are 150 at least. Uh, anyway, so ours weren't, ours were only 90. So we put, filled that with the 90 and then we sheeted over with, um, with 25 or 30, 25, yeah. But this was, this was the problem, sorry? They didn't use more than the roof of the Well, the, yes, that was, that was Matt's concern, yeah. but um, the, the wood does breathe. So, you know, um, and, and, and we're sealed on top because um, I'll come on to it later, but we sealed over the top of that floor so that it's kind of breathing from, from underneath. And um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, there's, there's vents under the house. This is, 
but this is the problem we had with mice were coming in um, and you know it was like a, a super highway and just in the middle of the wall there that's a little mouse hole and it was just they were just running everywhere and you can see the the air's got in and it's gone moldy um, no i'll just skip through that one even though it was 70th anniversary today but uh, um so these are the vents that they were getting through and i i you know they can get through that no problem at all so i just bought a sheet of perforated uh, stainless steel and um so we turned it on to everything we haven't had a mouse in the place since so again another little uh, aside here to remind everybody what we're up against cop 27 is just finished and it all seemed like a damp squib sorry it's an old-fashioned term that but it, it did so um so one of the things that did come out of COP27, though, is that uh, plans have been set um, in motion to make buildings a specific agenda under the Breakthrough Programme. And the reason for that is that um, the United Nations produce these tracking reports, and these two were produced just, just in time for COP27, and one for buildings, one for heating. And the red dot in the middle says, not on track for buildings, and for the heating, more efforts needed so you know it, this just reinforces that this is an area that we really have got to tackle um, in uh, 2021 the building operations accounted for 30 percent of global energy consumed and in 2021 building operations accounted for 27 percent of global co2 emissions so almost half of the energy demand for buildings was used for space and water heating in 2021 leading to megatons of direct emissions and that's just sort of hot off the, the press last month so onto windows now um we as matt's gone through we have lots of issues with windows uh, this one at the front of our house was rotten um and we really had to do something about it it's trust us in the most expensive window the one that went so we uh um did everything that uh, matt said got ourselves some decent windows we're double glazed mind you maybe i think if we'd done it again we probably would have gone for triple glazed um but that certainly sorted out triple glazed front door though um and again well sealed um all around and um we also did the same for other doors so uh on to the past 2035 that we're all working to now which we didn't know at the time um, it's basically this is their scope and it just says the national targets for the reduction of greenhouse gases are in response to the threat of climate change that we need significant improvements need to be made in the energy efficiency of the building UK's building stock in nearly all of our 27 and a half million homes which is a big job so um, past 2035 uh, Matt's talked about it a little bit um, this flow chart shows you that it's um, it's it's pretty involved and it you know it tries to to cover everything. It looks at all the energy efficiency measures that you 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 might need and just checks one against the other so that you're not conflicting. So you wouldn't do anything where the two red areas are. I mean, I know nobody can read that, but just to give you an idea, it's you know it's the corner there. So internal solid wall insulation, external just whatever one needs to be done by the retrofit coordinator. So we talked about stoves as well earlier. Uh, we had an open fire and because we'd sealed up the house, there was no point in having this thing. I think 30% of the heat can go up a chimney, something like that. So uh, it was a, <coughs> was it a backseat fire and it was drawing the air from underneath the house because it's suspended floor. So we, we took that out and then we, um, did exactly what Matt did and put in a, a vent from underneath the floor. Um, this thing above the this stove opening is actually a paving slab that, uh, <laughs> that they bolted onto the wall. Uh, quite a good idea actually because it, it absorbs heat and uh, gives it out later on in the evening. Um, and there it is working away nicely and we did actually put a half in. Um, then the the, the stove was really just um, a feature that we wanted because we didn't want to lose the fire, but actually it, it doesn't really do anything to, to warm the house anymore because we decided to go for overfloor heating. So these panels were glued onto the floor and that completely sealed the whole surface. And um, the ones that we had, they're, they're different now, but um, then we you pop these aluminium plates on top 
the new ones just have the aluminium already on the, the uh, EPS uh, polystyrene. And then once they're in, we put the pipes in and laminate flooring on top um, or tiles in the bathroom. Um, and this is the, the manifold that, uh, one of the manifolds is to the, uh, that feeds all the pipes um, from, the, from the heating system. And uh, it's a, a, a photograph really showing the kitchen now with the, um, with the underfloor heating working away, which is, is, is quite nice because you, you've got this warmth coming upwards rather than radiator needing to have convection. Well, um, this is what we did at the time because I didn't understand ground source heat pumps, couldn't trust anything I was hearing. So we put in um, an LPG system but it was very cheap to run compared with the, the storage heaters, as I'll mention later. So mechanical ventilation heat recovery, we decided on that because, you know, we've now sealed up the house. We've taken all the trickle vents off our windows, filled them up with um, body filler from, from, the, from Halfords um, and um, sealed the windows, everything. So now we have to have this ventilation. Um, that's, the air goes in one of these and comes out the other. Uh, and I haven't got a very good picture of it here, but this is the top of the um, the MVHR unit, and behind the red um, piece there is the filters. So we're filtering the air that's coming in and filtering the air that's going out. Um, and what happens is, from those big pipes, it goes into the to the um, the silver manifold that's at the uh, right hand side of the picture there, and then each one of these um, ducts goes off to a different room. There's two manifolds, there's that one there, and then there's one on the other side. So one uh, provides the, the fresh air in, and the other one takes the stale air out. And as Matt said, they go through this heat exchanger so that the warm moist air that's being chucked out heats the cool fresh air coming in. And, uh, are those pipes in or? Uh, Yes, they are. As you can see them, they're exposed. You can't see them now. So they are, um, they're not individually insulated, but they are underneath the insulation, yeah. Um, and well, this one here is just, you hardly notice that, but you can just see the, the, the duct there in the bedroom where the air comes in. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. And this is the controller. Um, what, what happens is we, we set this, I mean, it's, um, predates the, 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 the type that Matt was talking about where now you would just fit these things and they actually have, um, a moisture, uh, monitor in it or, uh, CO2 and they just ramp up and down here, we, we do it individually. And most of the time it's just on that low, low speed when Meg and I are in the house, but if yes, the family around, we got to, to, to the next one. Um, the other thing we loved doing was cooking on gas, um, LPG we had, um, great stuff, but um, that had to go because we have no air coming in. And like on Matt's one he had earlier, the Arga, we're gonna have to think about that because that big hole that uh, you're, uh, lady kept her groceries in. Uh, you can't seal that up when you've got a gas appliance or a, a burning appliance in, in, in the room. So we, we just went for an induction hob, um, which, well, I'm, I'm quite happy with it. I mean, <laughs> Meg will tell you later. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the thing we did though, right at the very beginning, and I've missed this out, should have been at the beginning, was we put on uh, 17 solar panels, uh, which gave us, um, a four kilowatt peak output of electricity. Um, and that's um, just to give you an idea of what happens in Daviat um, with solar panels. Um, it's, it's just really strange, but every, every May is the best year. And in June, it must be cloudy or something because there's just that dip and then it comes back up again. So we've got a perfect bell curve with a dip in the middle and that's over the last five years. Um, I, I unfortunately didn't have the monitoring equipment before that. Um, what we do is we um, we, we have this uh, solar eye boost uh, on the solar panels. So what happens is it, it just sort of senses if there's any electricity being exported from the house. And of course, um, that, if that does, then what it does is it switches on the immersion. So in the 10 years it's been there, it's, um, it's actually heated two and a half million liters of hot water for us which is a, a considerable saving. <laughs> then we went on, somebody mentioned heat pumps. Um, and 
a, a different session, we can talk about air source versus uh, ground source. Um, in Scotland, ground source is a no brainer, except that it costs money to put in the ground loop. Um, so what we had to do is we had to drill a hole. And if anybody's interested, we can go down to the house and you can have a look at this uh, after the session. Um, we, um, we drilled down to 198 meters, didn't need to go that far, but we had the rig on site and I wanted to do some experimentation just to see what the temperature is down there. So I'm working with the British Geological Survey and we're putting down a, a temperature sensor and they're going to monitor it for the next two years for, for us um, just to see what, what does actually happen in practice. Um, so drilling it, it was a bit messy, but um, our neighbours very kindly let us come across their amenity land. And what we should have had was a big skip to collect the water. And I thought yeah, it would be fine, just bond it. But it was a bit of a mess. Um, and um, yeah, uh, but it, it, it is controllable. Um, and there is actually a village in Cornwall that I visited two weeks ago where they are drilling one of these in everybody's front garden uh, for the community. Once the hole's drilled, then these guys, um, it looks like they're shoving this pipe down the hole, but that thing there is actually dragging it down. They're just guiding it, and it just pushed it down to the bottom of the hole. Um, and there's the pipes there. At the bottom of the picture, um, the pipes are insulated as they come up to, to ground level. We're just concerned that in anything that it would be safe, but the water in those is, is, is around about six degrees. Um, so it's it doesn't really need to be insulated because it's Sorry, what about six degrees Celsius, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there it is. That's the the heat pump um, that we put in. We made a little um, bothy outside. Um, oh right, this one here is um, on the uh, right hand picture is where our um, LPG gas boiler was. So we took it out and just plumbed it into the heat pump that's on the other side of the wall outside. Um, so really it was, you know, reconnect six pipes. That's all that was required to put this pump in. And then the LPG tank had to be dug up. Thanks Nick for excavating <laughs> it for me. <laughs> and um, yeah, it went. So it, it had five happy years in our, buried in our garden. Um, that's the wee boffy that we made at the back of the house just to house the heat pump. Uh, you know, again, no experience of these things. Didn't know whether it was going to be really noisy. We ha were going to put it in the utility room, but then we thought, mm, maybe not. Um, it could have gone in the utility room because it just purrs away like a fridge, which is actually what it is. Um, opportunities. When we had all the walls stripped off, um, my son said, um, oh, uh, you should be putting in Ethernet to every room. And I went, oh. And then actually it was right because it's just great because you know we've got so many TVs around that use the smart stuff now that uh, just works it. So the big window there, um, uh, my son brought back from Hong Kong and his uh, wife this uh, this little um, uh, Chinese um, good luck token. And I'm sitting there looking at it one day and it's going backwards and forwards. And I'm going, hold on a minute, we've just insulated the house, we've sealed it up. Why is that going backwards and forwards when the wind blows? And that was the answer. It was, we forgot to seal underneath the window. So up with the carpet, sealed it, job done. <laughs> it just shows you, you know, even with the best of plans. So you can see there the carpet, it's a low tog carpet and it even has the underlay. Um, and then uh, the, the bit over to the window, it's, it's just um, sort of um, panels that allow the carpet to sit on, sit on top of the, the pipes. So stairs down to the extension. Um, oops, we also missed a bit there. Um, and you know, there was a, with a retrofit, we couldn't rip the stairs out and insulate them underneath, would have been nice. We stuffed it all with, um, with loads of rock wool, but you can see that there's still leaking heat through there. And it actually was, um, it was the joints in the in the stairs, so we uh, foamed them up again <laughs> and solved it. Disruption, though, um, you know, for uh, eighteen months, most of our stuff was in this container in the front garden. Um, just you know, lots of lots of disruption, really. I mean, that that's our 
sitting room. <laughs> not, not at the moment, that was during. Um, that's our sitting room. So we had the log burner in, thank goodness, because uh, you know that kept us going. But it, it, I mean, this is a, it was a major, major job. We, we kind of rebuilt our house inside the house. Um, and um, that's the other sitting room. You can see it's, it's, there's a duct in the wall there, but on the inside of the insulation. So you have to watch your ducts and that. We, you know, we are keeping them on the inside. And yeah, well, it's, I parked under the uh, tent one night thinking that would be good to keep the snow off the car. <laughs> Gazebos don't take snow loading. Yeah, I don't know how to go back on this, yeah, but anyway. So um, why did we do it? So I'd been logging our electricity costs because um, Meg, uh, when we had uh, teenage kids, was going around turning the heating down. They were going around turning the heating up. So our, our peak year was in 2008 when we spent £3,558.04 on electricity to heat our house. So it just was unsustainable. That's night storage heaters with panel heaters called total heating, total control, which is a total lie because it's not total heating and not any control. So we, we, we lived through all of this. Um, and so, as you can see, in comparison, if I use the 34 pence per kilowatt hour um, that it's costing us now, if we still were sucking that amount of electricity into heat our house, we'd have, be having bills of around about £10,000 a year. Shocking. Whereas in, whereas in actual fact, this last year, it's cost us uh, £756 with the ground source heat pump. Um, can't quite see this, but... Um, this is the the uh, the reason I know it's the the heat pump comes with a very clever monitoring package, um, and so you can see that in uh, in 2022 you, we used 2,781 kilowatt hours of of energy to 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 uh, heat both hot water and um, and the uh, the heating, and and one of the things that happens when you start to insulate your house is that hot water becomes a bit of an issue uh, it's it then it's you're, you're spending almost as much and in matt's case on passive houses much more on heating hot water than you are on heating the house so that's it just graphically shown those those years from uh, 2003 up to 2013 and then the last one is 2022 just it gives a kind of a visual idea of what we managed to achieve Yes, yeah. Um, I the, the problem is I didn't. I mean, I have monitored it, but it, it's because we were messing about all the, that period in between. It was 2013 when we set off to do this, so it it's, wouldn't really have proved anything because it was before and after, if you like, really. Yeah, yeah. So we've been through that uh, again. Deep retrofit. Um, yeah, it's just what uh, what we've said. Um, and just to remind everybody that, you know, Zero Carbon Daviat, this is our area, which is not just the village of Daviat, but the um, the boundaries of the school and the uh, voting area. And that's all the things we do. So that's me. Um, yes, that's a good question. And, and I did. And n no. Um, yeah, yeah. And it would have. And the thing is, uh, we have all the costs and I have not analysed them and I must do it. But, you know, like, you know, you don't need to put Ethernet cables in your house. That's in the cost as well. You know? And um, we also took the opportunity because we were um, lifting the floors. The joiner went, you know, don't put the floors back down again because that stuff just turns to, to hamster bedding. You know, so we, we did put new floors in which just chipboard but you know that's another cost now which would be good to avoid um, uh, more embodied carbon um, and also what we did was we um, because it's 1970s house we took the opportunity to, to put in nice skirtings and door moldings and new doors so all of that is into the into the mix so uh, yeah it's a very good question <laughs> I can't answer but I will go away and uh, do that analysis yeah, yeah, well, the thing is, um, 
thing is, I, I haven't. I haven't. I really haven't, um, and that's why I should do the analysis. But going back to what Matt said, is um, it's 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 done more than insulate our home and take the, the the costs down. What it's done is it's given us a really the atmosphere in the house is really nice. I mean, it um, all three of our kids had asthma um, when our son was staying with us um, during COVID. Uh, he couldn't work outside in our wee sututory because of the, the the pollen. Came into the house and no problem whatsoever because the, you know the MVHR filters it all out. So uh, I slept much to make the noise for 30 years with the bedroom window open because I just didn't like a stuffy bedroom. The day we switched this thing on, the window was shut and it's never been open since. So it's it's, it's a lot more to it really. And and Matt's talked about the um, the effect of of cold air we, we just don't have drafts anymore it, it's just a very pleasant place to be in um so it's it, we just love our house really um and you know when we go away it's nice to come back because it's such a comfortable place to, to be uh, just on that yeah he's asking a question oh sorry so he's saying the ventilation system is it noisy <laughs> right yeah so um he would install it above his bedroom yes so we have installed it above our kitchen and we just don't hear it even when it's on boost but you can hear it outside um when it's on boost and it does sound like being behind a chip shop on a friday night um but the reason for that is that the designers of it because i now design these systems and i know that they made the the exit duct too small um because basically, it's it, you can't hear the, you can't hear the air inside the duct. It's just when it exits, and the velocity they um, ended up with was too high, and and it's as simple as that really. Just keep the the exit and entry velocities down, and you'll have no noise at all. So so you you, know, you just can't hear it is the answer to that question in the house. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how do we get back on this can i um oh, right. yeah that's the one yeah just repeat the question for people online <laughs> right so um the the question was um what is the what are the boundaries of deviate um can i make that a bit bigger again we're just a community group so. yeah yeah so we 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 we're zero carbon deviate and and we we set it up so that you know that it, it was clear that it was for the community and not just like the village because often you know things of this nature you know people in the outlying um in our farms and 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 hamlets uh, uh, feel excluded so we we wanted to make it clear that it was for this but as matt said we share everything that we do universally and um, we have actually inspired others to, to, to follow suit. So Udney have set up a, a group. I think Newborough have. Um, there was already a group in Afford. Um, and we've joined a, a wider network, um, which is called SCAN, which is Scotland Climate um, Action ne Network. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so it's, yeah. <coughs> Anything we've got that we, we can present to, to anybody, it's all free for nothing, really. Yeah. Have a look on the website and yeah. you're welcome to join in. Yeah. 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 And then that's a quick question for you, Ken. I was searching for it. And Matt, um, the houses that are getting the solid wall insulation or solid block insulation, I mean, when, when is it the solid block insulation versus you know, the electric fixed or the Sheridan Valley Service? So, so, so for those online, the question was um, referring to the to the the, the houses in the village um, that are having external wall insulation added, um, and the question was, you know, wh which how do you choose between internal wall insulation and external wall insulation? So I'll, I'll let Matt answer this, but I'll give you my answer first. Is I looked at external wall insulation for our house, and I came to the conclusion that. Um, because the house is ventilated behind the block work because the outside of our house is, is rendered block work but that's just to keep the weather off the real outside of the house is the sheet behind the timber frame and so i could see no way of, of actually insulating that without 
you know, because it, the house has to be insulated, has, has to be um, ventilated, so the air is coming up behind. So for me, the external wall insulation wouldn't work. But for the houses um, up um, at Corm, um, it, it's the different construction, and um, you know, Matt can maybe explain how that works, where that did work. So, uh, in my opinion, for our house, we had no option. I think Matt has got some solutions to that, but. Um, yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I guess I just think, yeah. oh, stand next to me, stand next. Sorry. Near enough. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's just that whether your house is timber frame or whether it's two loose of masonry, that's that's kind of the main thing and, and how it's ventilated. You just have to um, think about it. So, um, yeah, you need an overall strategy for the building. So, uh, but a, a really important consideration there as well is MDHR because that can cure a lot of ills if you're going to just seal off the whole building, uh, you know, so that can deal with the internal moisture problems, but you need an overall strategy for the whole building. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that earlier on. We, we know we need to do it, but we, we haven't put the triple vents in, so I guess the question I have for myself is, uh, do we need to do something else for them? Do we get the time to uh, do the vents in? Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, I'm... MVHR is one of the, the best things we did, actually. I just wish we'd done it years ago, even before we insulated the house. Um, it would have, you know, it just just made the atmosphere completely, you know, much, much better. Yeah. Um, if you live in Shetland, yes. <laughs> they completely buy into this, but it's not, no. I mean, it's just... Um, I'll say this so Matt doesn't get on his high horse, but I mean, it's just crazy we're building houses now that will have to be retrofitted in the future. Yeah, so it's worth saying, you know, standards, you've got the Scottish building standards, and there is a revision to new builds coming out, and the Scottish government are also developing a retrofit standard. Um, but, you know, that's the bottom line. You can, if you've got higher ambitions, mm -hmm. go for passive house for new build, go for benefit for retrofit. Um, and there's other standards by the ACB and Letty and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But yeah, aiming for a standard, I think, is important mm -hmm. because it, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, we had a question here. Yeah. Right, so the, the question was, can we put uh, the overfloor heating in upstairs rooms or is it just for downstairs? And the answer is yes, you can. Uh, we have it upstairs and um, I've put it into several uh, houses that I've worked with with heat pumps. Um, although I was speaking to an architect um, at the tariff show and he said, no, you can't do that. And I said, why not? He said, well, um, if you want to get the NHBC guarantee for a house, they don't like to have water upstairs. And I went, well, what's inside the radiators? And yeah. yes, uh, so I mean, that's something that clearly needs to be tackled. And, you know, whether he got that wrong or not, I don't know. But the, I mean, why not? Um, it's, it's a great system. It's just, you know, lovely getting out of bed and got warm toes in the morning. Yeah. Why are building companies still selling new houses? I can go on to Social uh, Homes just now and they'll sell me a new house. And it's got uh, an air cool heat pump, I think, or a heat pump. Mm -hmm. But it's still only a B rated insulation. Yeah. So the question was, why are house builders still building substandard quality houses? <laughs> it's the same answer as to why the water companies are pumping sewage into our rivers. It's proper, it's as simple as. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are one or two house builders who are now looking at passive house because I think, you know, it's growing in popularity, but it's always an added extra option. And, and, and we have a real problem around thinking long-term. So the average passive house uh, costs 8% more to build. 
that 8% pays itself back in the first 10 years. It's a no-brainer. So to my mind, what we should be doing is selling new houses with the first 10 years of energy bills. That would adopt passive house immediately, but of course, that's a big ask. But I mean, it's, yeah, you're in this situation where energy is going up. Yeah, it's criminal. Well, Okay, so if uh, I realize we're at 12 o'clock there, so appreciate everyone's patience. There's just one last little sort of slightly different thing I wanted to talk about. Oh, yes, please. Um, Well, the, the, the problem is that, um, well, there's a lot of problems with EPC, but um, I uh, haven't had it redone. Um, I, I do EPCs myself, um, so I'd have to get somebody else to do it. But the, the problem is that I cannot um, I cannot say that the walls are better and the floor is better unless I have um, a, um, a drawing that shows what's been done. Uh, signed off, um, you know, by building models, which we can do because it's just insulation, you know, um, or engineers' calculations, which clearly I've done, but they have to be independent. So the um, the, 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 the domestic energy uh, assessor has to put it down as as built. So mm -hmm. the EPC for my house is 1977, and that's what it is. Yeah, you, you can. You can have it um, retrospectively. retrospectively. You can have a heap of evidence, and unfortunately, the, the body that does it are not open space. Good air quality and ventilation in our homes. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, they they tweak the EPCs every couple of years or every year, you know, depending on what energy cycle they're on. Yeah, so it is to do with energy cycle. Um, there's just one other question online from Ian saying the new 2000 new social homes being built in Aberdeen are, to the gold standard is this adequate? Um, yeah, it'll be a lot better, um, but it's still t the energy per square meter is still double what a passive house is at the Scottish gold standard. So yeah, it's, it's a good a good move in the right direction. It could be passive house, but at least they're doing something. Um, right, so just a little bit of something different here, and uh, you may all just laugh at this idea, uh, but hopefully you'll take away a, a little thought about this. But, um, you know, obviously, Zero Carbon Daviot, we've got a whole range of projects going on, and we're trying to do as much as we can to um, mitigate climate change. Uh, but really, the, the, the kind of scale of the challenge is just so massive. Re rejigging everything we do in terms of 
you know, transport, how, what, what we eat, how, where we go, how we hit our homes, all this stuff. And, um, you know, it, it, obviously we appreciate that um, the retrofitting thing, as Ken has shown, is, is expensive. And I guess just to kind of put it in context with um, uh, some of the work I do, the retrofit plans that I generate for people, which probably go a bit further than what Ken's done, the overall price for houses ranges from between 50,000 on average sized homes to 90,000 on massive homes. So, you know, uh, it, 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 it is a huge cost. Uh, but um, the whole point of this community group is trying to do things together. And can we have efficiencies of scale? Can we learn from each other? Uh, you know, power in numbers. So, um, I spend a lot of time thinking about this and thinking, well, you know, at one point I was thinking, well, how could we just fund uh, retrofit for people in Daviot? Because it's obvious that not everyone can afford it. Um, but what else are we doing? You know, we're looking at installing renewable energy sources. We definitely need more sustainable transport in Daviot because we all have cars and we all have to drive to the shops. Um, so, but, but could all these things be kind of, considered together you know at one point i was thinking well if we had a, our own wind turbine that would create a, probably a, a decent revenue for the community would it fund retrofit for everyone and really that, that that model isn't strong enough but there's there's other models to consider so um this is kind of inspired by an organization called bankers without boundaries who um set up about i think about 10 years ago uh and they do a lot of thinking like this on big scales and they uh, have come up with the concept of net zero neighborhoods or, or green neighborhoods, where they're trying to tie all these things together into one kind of funding model for the whole village. So I was thinking, well, hmm, could that work in Daviot? Um, so, you know, we know that our existing buildings in Daviot are, are, are around about the national average of an EPC of D, so they all need work. Um, and, um, you know, ballpark figure I'm just roughly saying what it, it, it could cost 60,000 pounds per house uh, now that's obviously a, a vast amount of money um, but what else have we got um, so you know if you look at how this has been done in other places uh, there's a company called Energy Sprong who've done deep retrofit of um, rows of houses in uh, Holland, and now they've just done a trial project in Nottingham, which is what you can see on the right here. They manufacture panels off site, they, which makes it really cheap and affordable. Uh, they do deep retrofit, uh, they fit mechanical ventilation. So you're basically getting Ken's level of uh, performance uh, in these houses, uh, pretty close to the passive house benefit standard. But the really impressive thing about this is that it was funded by the energy supplier. The, company Energy Sprong spoke to the energy supplier for this area and said, you know, could you partner with us to make this possible? Because the people living in these homes couldn't afford the, the 50 or 60 grand it costs to do these homes. So they set up an agreement whereby the energy company funded the retrofit and the people who live in these homes um, were already capable of paying their energy bills. You know, this is before the energy crisis, but they're paying their energy bills and now the retrofit was done. It took two weeks to retrofit all those houses because there was very little sort of, they, they didn't have to move out. The, the building was wrapped from the outside. Uh, there was one day where they changed the windows. So they stayed in their homes. They um, have now obviously got much lower energy use, but they're still paying similar energy bills. And you know, on the whole, they don't mind because they've now got a much warmer, healthier home. Now, obviously, because they're using less energy, there's an overpayment there, and that's what's paying back the, the funds that the energy provider has put forward. Great model, great model. And there's lots of different models about whether you could give away some equity in, ex, in your home in exchange for, for funds for retrofit and things like that. But to my mind, this is like a really, a really useful model. So what if we had an energy company in Daviot that, that kind of could do that for people as well? Now, what else would a Davia energy company do? Well, we could look at wind turbines and solar uh, farms, which is something we're looking at in zero carbon Davia. Um, and 
you know, if you actually do the numbers, if we retrofitted every home in Daviot to be as efficient as Ken's, it would only take two, maybe three wind turbines to power the whole village, 450 homes. Now, is that important about you know, energy security and energy dependence? I, I don't think so. I think it's more about just having a sustainable village. Um, but you know, the other thing is these wind turbines could generate some income and uh, doing agri-solar like this could be really viable for us because we've got lots of farmland. You can still use the fields and, and harvest energy at the same time. Um, so that's part of the picture. Then heat networks, you know, do we all really want our own heat pump? I know everyone, you know, likes to have control of their heating, but actually heat pumps can be a really cost effective, heat networks, sorry, can be a really cost effective way of heating a group of houses. So if you're in a cul-de-sac, can you and your five neighbors uh, benefit from the economies of scale of having one or two or three boreholes to heat all your houses all in one grid? You still pay for what you use, but you've got a combined infrastructure that's come at a lower cost. So what I've kind of been, uh, sorry, right. So then we've got all these other little, little smaller projects like um, the opportunities for a car club, um, e-bike hire, you know, we've, we've thankfully, uh, we've got some e-bike community e-bikes coming to Daviot um, and there'll be a small rental income from that. Uh, you know, perhaps there are opportunities for selling sort of, other things that are made uh, in, in, in the village, uh, like, you know, produce from a community garden or, or composting or, or things like this. But adding all these things together, you also have to think about the co-benefits. So, you know, what are the other benefits that um, would, would re reduce the burden on broader infrastructure? Uh, so if our homes use less energy, there's less load on the grid. Would the electricity, would the, would the, the, would the grid maybe uh, help us with finance for, for lessening the impact on their grid? Because we know the grid's gonna be under strain. If we make our homes healthier and we will have better ventilation, there'll be less cases of asthma. Kids will have better attendance. Uh, there'll be le lower burden on the NHS. You know, would, would the local NHS or would the local authorities kind of, um, you know, help in that way? We already know uh, two weeks ago that NHS Grampian are running a trial where um, uh, people with, um, I think it's respiratory conditions, uh, the NHS are going to issue a prescription to pay their energy bills because they've worked out it's cheaper to pay their energy bills and keep those people warm than treating them in hospital because of the side effects of them being cold. So, you know, I, it may sound a bit kind of pie in the sky, but I think actually these things are getting tangible. So if you add all these things together, do you, can you end up with a model that's, that's actually um, sustainable? So totally back of a fag packet calculations. But if you retrofit 450 homes, you'd need 27 million. You could spend 8 million on renewable energy generation and 4 million pounds on heat networks, gives you a total sum of 39 million. Now, obviously that's a big number to you or me, but. 39 million, it's not, it's not actually a totally astronomical figure to, to create a completely sustainable village. And, you know, um, so what, what, what are the incomes? Well, on the right-hand side, you'd be saving uh, energy. And if you, if you follow this model of overpayments on the energy bills, uh, you've got an income from that. You've got some income from your wind turbine. You're paying interest on the loan, obviously. But um, to, to fund all this, but other little pieces of tangible income uh, and maybe some of these co-benefits could produce, you know, a tangible figure that would repay a 39 million pound loan in sort of 58 years. So, you know, that sounds totally crazy, maybe, but it's kind of pen pension fund territory. Uh, and what I wanted to do today is essentially just share that crackpot idea with you and, and see what you think about it. And um, yeah, I've already had one brief conversation with someone from the Scottish National Infrastructure Bank on this. And um, because they were set up by Scottish government to fund uh, the green transition. And one of the things that they've got on their targets is communities. So uh, he's keen for a follow up chat. But I don't really want to just go out there pegging it on my own without knowing that, you know, we've thought about it a little bit as a community. 
So there it is. I'll open to the floor. Just, just to add to, uh, <coughs> to that sort of argument that you've come up actually, I've got a bit of a leg and down in Cornwall, and I visited uh, 10 different pumps, and <coughs> they set up a company at the beginning of this year called Kenji Utilities. And they are funded by Legion in general, the pension pot, um, because what they're doing is they are putting um, a heat network into a village called Sivians in Cornwall. So I went and visited Sivians and I spoke to the parish councillor there because I thought, well, there's two sides to every story. What do they think of it? And they were just thought it was a fantastic idea. And they, there are only something like 120 homes able to do this, and they're completely oversubscribed because people want to put these, uh, these systems in. Now, this is not retrofit. This is heat pumps, and of course, we know we do have issues with actually putting low end, low carbon systems into homes just what we can do the retrofit. But the point that Matt's making, it's not so high in the sky. There are big organisations out there that want to to spend this money. And the, the CEO of Ken for Heat Pumps said the the um, the pension funds were a bit disappointed with these small figures of four million. They are only looking for two hundred million to invest in. Now, if you go across the pond, there's a company called Dandelion, and they are actually funding heat networks in America. Um, Dandelion's parent is a company that has lots of money called Google. So you know. We, we are moving towards what Matt's talking about, but we just need to try and get that same interest for retrofit because you might have seen Matt's uh, article in yesterday with Stephen Jay, um, where it, it said more than what was it, heat pumps are not the answer. Whereas it wasn't, really what you meant to say. It wasn't quite what I said. <laughs> so, well, part of the answer. Yeah, part of the answer. So, <laughs> so heat pumps are part of the answer. And, you know, it, you know we get this amazing um, coefficient of performance of, of six in our house but it's not because we've got a good heat pump it's because we've got good insulation we've got air tightness we've got mechanical ventilation and heat recovery we've got underfloor heating and that's what gives us the coefficient of performance of six and what does coefficient of performance of six means it means our heat pump is working at 600 percent efficiency so for every kilowatt of electricity that comes into our house we're getting six kilowatts of heat out it's phenomenal. It's, it's, that, it's, it's the system. It's not just the heat pump. Is that because you're so deep down in the ground that you're nope, nope. It's it's just it's the system. It means that because we've got a well insulated house and floor heating, we are running the water temperature at 29 degrees, and that saves a lot of energy because it's like shoving a, a rock up a hill. You know, temperature is the same. You know, goes up further up. So if you're going if water coming into the house at five degrees and heating it up to 70 degrees for radiators, it's a lot harder than heating it up to 29 degrees. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's all part of the system. Mm -hmm. um, What's the return flow function? The return flow is 26. So you need 26 yeah. 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 You mean taking into account solar input and like the. Uh, well, yes, I should probably mention that as well, yeah. Um, because, you know, in, in my little talk there, we are. Uh, not actually needing any uh, energy to heat water. It was from uh, February until October. It's a little bit less than that now because the heat pump gave the electricity first. Right. Mm -hmm. and what, how much electricity did you need in this case? Um, that was a figure that we got there, I can't remember. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so that'll be. You've got Ken talking about heat pumps again. Yeah, how, yeah, how dare you? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll come. We'll have a look afterwards, shall we? And uh, yeah. Yeah, about two thousand. So um, yeah, just circling back to this. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the idea of the energy company, you know. Yeah, I, I, I'd really like to continue thinking about this big scale of project. And um, if anyone uh, has a background in kind of financial planning or whatever and would like to assist, then uh, that would be fantastic. You can pick holes in my numbers. Um, but beyond that, you know, we are still looking at renewable energy in Daviot. Uh, so I think and eventually we will need an energy company anyway uh, to kind of deal with the transaction of that. Uh, but maybe we can do something today 
as well. And uh, so we've launched a survey to basically try and understand um, how people, how much energy people are using in the village, because we think maybe that actually we could, there's some basic learning from each other that we could do about, you know, who the best supplier is for electricity around us, uh, who the best supplier for oil is around us. Could we benefit from getting, you know, multiple homes uh, delivered at the same time to bring down costs? Um, you know, I know there was an, an oil club that you could join in to get reduced rates. Maybe we can talk to them. Um, you know, so if, uh, if you can go online and fill in the survey, that would really help us kind of start building some data and understanding our energy usage as a, as a community. Um, but yeah. Yeah, ask everyone to. Yeah, please. It's online. Just go to the website and, uh, and uh, you see it under our projects. Uh, it's uh, energy survey. Just takes five, 10 minutes, although it does ask you information about your bills. So it's good to go and have a look at your bills first and before you go online and do it. Um, but yeah, that's the end of the slides and, and, and us talking, but happy to hang around and ask, ask some more questions. Matt, Matt stole the voting thing, but we're, we're a busy group. So um, part of our transport thing, so that um, opportunity for grant money, uh, zero carbon data included in um, that application as well for a community car. For the village, and um, you would book that in the same fashion as um, the e bike system, you'll be able to use it in the same brewery and back or um, take it for a day, whatever we have to. So, <clears throat> fingers crossed when the voting comes out, that's going to be on the list as well. We had a lot of questions about how that would function and operate and be insured and whatever else because the grant money for everyone was capital funding, things to buy, not things to out fund and, and work in. But um, I think I answered all the, the questions. So the voting for all these projects will be sh really soon, uh, beginning of December, I think, um, because it has to be implemented by March, end of the year. So um, they haven't really told us how the voting's coming out. We're getting slips in the post, but um, or if it's going to be electronic, we don't really know. But um, yeah, try and. On the community car one, we um, had a session with uh, Huntley uh, Development Group, and they, they have a uh, few community cars. Yeah. There. And what they found is that some people have actually got rid of their second car, you know, because they just don't need it now. And you just need one car. And, and I think COVID made a big difference. A lot of friends got rid of their loose car when it came to the end of the term and uh, working from home and didn't, didn't use it. And, I've been managing on a single car, but actually sometimes you just need that opportunity to go to an appointment and do something. Um, and if it works well and, and it can fund, then we could look at uh, increasing it. But we um, we tried four wheels and whatever else, and we're too small a business proposition for us to, to fund in the village. So we'll try it a different way. If we can, it'll be, it'll be down to votes, but we'll, we'll put it in there. So. Yeah, and apparently the way the voting is going to work is that each person will get 10 votes. Yeah, so the problem was they needed to wait the system because if some bigger centre like in Brewery put 10 projects through from 10 community groups and everybody in the Brewery voted for all the projects, it's an Aberdeenshire one and there's a Murray one and there's an Aberdeen City one and they haven't had time to figure out how do you represent every project equally and let people vote for it. So a system they've used in the past was to make sure you had to vote for 10 projects in order or whatever it would be. So it should kind of spread that. You vote for your favourite one, but everybody has to, you know, you have to vote for them. But we don't even know how many projects even apply. So, well, I do. No, there was um, there was 300 yeah, applications across Aberdeen City and Shire uh, in Murray uh, that totaled a million, three million quid. Uh, and there's only a one million pot of money. So. Thanks. Yeah, it's got, uh, some of them won't get through the qualification yeah, yeah, criteria, that's, that's but, been right now. but um, yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, that's good. That's a good update. One of the things that I would like to see is the village having its own turbine where we can all benefit from it. And it may well be there are people here who are, would like to invest in it to, to get a greater benefit from it, but it would certainly benefit the whole village and it would give us our own energy security. Because the price of electricity is just going up and up and up. And when you're working, you don't tend to think about it so much. But when you retire, 
when you are considering the cost of bills, then that's the that's a big time to, to focus on that. So if we were able to secure uh, a plot of land on top of the hill somewhere and build a wind turbine, I think that would be super. Yeah, so we are still working on that and um, we have a consultant who is actively looking at that, but it's kind of on hold at the moment because the consultant's kind of view is that the uh, planning regulations are on the way to change and make it more favorable uh, for us. So uh, we're looking at solar as well alongside that. Um, but regards to investing, I think I'd still like to think of invest because I'm sure you're right. There's other people in the village who would like to do that as well. Again, to wrap it as one package as, of a green neighborhood, I think would be more powerful. Um, and it, you know, I've quoted that number of sixty thousand for a retrofit. I think in reality, a lot of people have put their own money in, so they might put, you know, a few thousand of their own in and require less out of the fund, and there'd be a huge amount of work to do to make that work. But um, yeah, I appreciate your comments, Nick, and yeah, let's try and take it forward. Cool. Right, it's half past twelve, so we've overrun. But right. thank so you for coming. If anybody wants to come visit, him. oh yeah, if anyone would like to go to the Kens to see a heat pump, then um, follow Ken. And thanks to those attending online. Cheers, Paul. Right.